Good morning, and welcome to Medicine Grand Rounds. It's really a pleasure today to introduce one of our own, Jeremy Smith. Uh, Jeremy um, uh, was born in New York, went to high school in California, and then went off to BU, where he took his undergraduate degree and graduated Phi Beta Kappa. Uh, he then went on to uh, Northwestern uh, School of Medicine, where he took his doctorate, and also took residency at Northwestern, serving as chief medical resident at Cook County Hospital. He uh, spent some time in uh, Malawi, Central Africa, and served as a clinical instructor then at university at Northwestern University, um, and then an assistant professor, and then moved on uh, relatively briefly to um, the uh, um, University of Illinois uh, when we were then successful in recruiting him first as a clinical assistant professor, and then seeing his, his really great talent for education, he shifted to the CHS track and since 2011 has been assistant professor uh, of medicine. He's also a core faculty for our residency program. He's a member of a number of distinguished societies, including clerkship directors in internal medicine in the past, and currently with the American College of Physicians and the Society of General Internal Medi Medicine. He's had some grant support from our own education committee in terms of his education activities. He's published both papers and uh, book chapter, but he's really known for being a scholar in education. And uh, it's not easy to become known nationally, but he has actually become nationally known. Um, starting with the Stanford uh, Education Scholars Group that he uh, studied with, but then beyond that he is uh, serving in a number of different capacities. Really on a national level he represents us along with Andy Urban and Bennett Vogelman in terms of our, inc of our increasingly successful CME program that we do uh, annually. He's a good citizen nationally and internationally. He's uh, done service in Kenya, Honduras, and Malawi, as mentioned. And uh, he's involved nationally as the founder and coordinator of the Faculty Development Interest Group in the Society of General Internal Medicine and on the Education Committee of the Society of General Internal Medicine. Along the way, he's received a number of awards, including Best Doctors in America, Top Docs in Madison, I won't even begin to list the number of teaching awards, but it's interesting that throughout his career he's been recognized for being a, uh, a distinguished educator, really teaching us how to teach. And on that um, uh, topic, we're really fortunate today to have Jeremy talk about uh, this very important topic and one of my favorite lines, Bueller, Bueller. Um, what Ferris Bueller's teacher, teacher taught, can t show us about medical education. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Jeremy Smith. Name the single greatest living public speaker, the single greatest orator currently alive. Barack Obama? Bill Clinton? Anyone else? Okay. Move to the head of the class. In 2012, Barack Obama was locked in a tight re-election campaign against Mitt Romney. And at the Democratic National Convention that year, ex-president Bill Clinton delivered what some political pundits believe is one of the greatest political speeches ever given. In fact, there are political analysts who believe that the reason Barack Obama got re-elected was because Bill Clinton moved the needle with this speech. So let's watch the master in action. The Romney plan fails the first test of fiscal responsibility. The numbers just don't add up. I mean, consider this. What would you do if you had this problem? Somebody says, oh, we've got a big debt problem. We've got to reduce the debt. So what's the first thing he says we're going to do? Well, to reduce the debt, 
We're going to have another $5 trillion in tax cuts. Heavily weighted to upper income people. So we'll make the debt hole bigger before we start to get out of it. Now, when you say, what are you going to do about this $5 trillion you just added on? They say, oh, we'll make it up by eliminating loopholes in the tax code. So then you ask, well, which loopholes and how much? You know what they say? See me about that after the election. I'm not making it up. That's their position. See me about that after the election. Now, people ask me all the time how we got four surplus budgets in a row. What new ideas did we bring to Washington? I always give a one-word answer. Arithmetic. How does this guy do it? How does he have the audience just sitting in the palm of his hand? This must be genetic. Right? This has to be God-given talent, inherent ability. In 1988, almost exactly 24 years before the speech I just showed you, there was another Democratic National Convention, this time nominating Mike Dukakis. And the person selected to give the nominating speech that year was a little-known governor from Arkansas, by the name of William Clinton. Let's see how the master does 24 years earlier. Not exactly holding them in the palm of his hand, is he? Is it possible this is not genetic? Is it possible that these are skills that can be learned, that can be taught, skills that you and I can acquire? Well, my argument for you today is yes. And so the first thing you might be thinking is this. Well, how, what does this matter to me? What does this have to do with medicine? What does this have to do with cryoglobulinemia? What does this have to do with multiple endocrine neoplasia. Well, if you stop and think about it for a second, no matter what aspect of academic medicine we're involved in, the ability to communicate effectively, to talk to a group of people and have them listen to you and pay attention to you is crucial. So if you're a teacher, and I'll be talking a lot about medical education today, this is obvious. They've done studies in the education literature where they look at how much of a lecturer's words and thoughts are captured in the student's notes. What percentage of a lecturer's ideas are found when they look at the student's notes, would you guess? Yeah, 10%, 10%. When they assess students three weeks after a lecture, 20 to 40% of the lecturer's ideas are retained. 60 to 80% of what we say is just lost in the ether forever. But it's not just if you're a teacher. If you are a researcher, you 
might find yourself at a national research conference standing behind a podium trying to hold the attention of 150 people listening to you talk about your research niche. Or if you're an administrator and a leader, the ability to communicate effectively and clearly and in an articulate way as you run a meeting or as you lead a team is crucial. So these skills are paramount no matter what aspect of academic medicine we find ourselves in. And so therefore, I have a couple of goals for you today. Here's what I want for you to accomplish. I would like you to walk out of here being able to use new, specific behaviors that allow you to capture and hold the attention of an audience and promote their understanding of what you're saying and their retention. I want you to be able, when this is all done, to use visual aids effectively, including PowerPoint, to achieve goal number one. And finally, we'll be talking about a coaching program sponsored by the Department of Medicine that we've, that we've introduced where we are coaching fellow faculty members on these communication skills. So my goal is that at the end you'll be able to describe how coaching can help you accomplish goals one and two. And so here's how we're going to get through it. We're going to start by talking about dynamic public speaking. When we're done with that, we'll talk about ways and techniques to promote understanding and retention by the audience. We'll then talk about leveraging visual aids, including PowerPoint, and then we'll wrap up by talking about the coaching program. So at this moment, I would like everybody to take out a, either a piece of paper or take out your phone and open up your notes page. I want everybody to have something ready to write on because I want you to jot down notes for yourself, things that we talk about that resonate with you or that are impactful or meaningful to you. So get something ready to write on. So let's acknowledge as we talk about dynamic public speaking, let's acknowledge the elephant in the room, the anxiety factor. Right? The, the human brain is an amazing organ. It, it starts working the moment you're born and it never stops until the moment you get up to speak in front of a group of people. And so we're going to be talking about how, not only to techniques that can help you overcome the anxiety, but actually ways that you can use the anxiety to improve the effectiveness of your performance. And so it's always a good idea when we start a discussion like this to talk about what not to do. So, it's probably a given that expressiveness is one of the premier qualities when you're speaking in public. The expressiveness of a teacher has been found in the education literature to correlate with student ratings of teachers. That may not be a surprise to you. But the expressiveness of the teacher has also been found to correlate with student test scores. So there's something about it that actually can improve and enhance learning. Which profession out there has, you think, the, the best, most talented public speakers? How about these guys? Uh-oh. <coughs> that was uh, my fault, wasn't it? No, Wait. not at all. Okay. Televangelists. Anyone know this guy? Joel Osteen. If you want to see an amazing public speaker, just YouTube televangelist. Do you know where this is? Dodger Stadium. 80,000 people hanging on his every word. What are these guys doing that's so engaging that people are in 10, 20,000 seat auditoriums listening to every single thing they're saying? So let's break it down. We'll start by something called a POW statement. So a POW statement is defined as the first words that come out of your mouth. 
when you start speaking. And a POW statement is something engaging, something grabby, something catchy. So it can be a factoid, an interesting factoid. It can be a story. It can be, in the world of medicine, it can be a case. It can be a question. The first thing I said when I came out here, name the single greatest living public speaker. An example of not a POW statement would be, thank you for the great introduction. That was really kind. We're going to talk today about bunion disease, and I hope to share with you all the exciting aspects of bunions and the different intricate ways that... So the, the purpose of a POW statement is to, is to get people to do a double take. That's what you want. You want everyone in the audience to sort of do one of those. What's going on up there? This sounds interesting. And the fact that they think that there may be something interesting and unusual about to happen. Magazine writers know this. If you read a magazine article or a newspaper article, the first sentence is often something very catchy, right? So the same concept applies here. Let's talk about eye contact. So the thing that's so interesting to me about this is that what you do with your eyes is almost always happening unconsciously. And part of what I do for my work here is watch small group teachers. And it's amazing to me when I watch and pay attention what people are doing with their eyes. They're, you would not imagine having a dinner party and not looking at everybody evenly. And think about how it makes you feel when someone doesn't make eye contact with you. And yet the eye contact from teachers in small groups is almost always uneven. And by the way, I'm guilty of this too. I'm not innocent. But it's happening under the radar. We're not aware of it. And which type of student do you think is the most likely to get the least eye contact from the teacher? Which type of student? The ones who are disengaged. The ones who are not as interested. The ones who need our attention the most. And who are the ones we're looking at? The bright-eyed, bushy-tailed gunners. Right? The ones who need us the least. And so the key here is just making yourself conscious of it, making yourself aware of it. When you become mindful of what you're doing with your eyes, and that's a bit of a challenge because our mental bandwidth is completely taken up by thinking about what we're doing next, right? What we're going to say next, what we're teaching about. But if you can open up a little bit and think about what are my eyes doing, number one, you will immediately recognize you're not being even, and number two, you can fix it. So what about in a large group setting, like a big didactic format like this? Well, there are different techniques you can use. One is to look at one person as you make one point. And then as you move to the next point, you might look at somebody else. And then as you make a third point, you look at someone else in the eye. That's option A. Another option is to divide the room into thirds. And as you start a point, you might look at this part of the audience. And as you move on to your next point, you might look over here. And you might finish by looking over here. One thing you might want, not want to do is the old look out at the horizon trick. I'm not looking at anybody right now, but I am going to see if the sun rises or sets. Okay? Or you might also consider avoiding this. This is the, I'm narrating a slideshow. And um, how's my back look? Do I have anything up here? Is this okay? And maybe turn around occasionally. Ideally, you want to be looking at the audience and you want them to be looking at you. One good measure of how effective you're doing is to look at the eyes of the audience and how many of them are on you and how many are on the screen or on their phones, right? So that's eye contact. Now, what do we do with these things? These are awkward. As soon as you start thinking about this, it becomes very awkward, right? So there's the, there's the fig leaf approach that you could try, right? Or there's the approach of just in case Rocky Balboa comes in here, I'm protecting my ribs, so I'm safe from that. There really never is anybody who can show us something like this more effectively than Will Ferrell. And so uh, Will Ferrell here is Ricky Bobby, the race car driver, getting his first ever television interview. And he'll show us something about what to do with our hands.
That's, not, that's what not to do. But it is true that the more, you, the more energy you can put into your gestures, the more expressive you can come across, the more dynamic you come across. So let's talk about, let's talk about this. So the podium is very safe. I feel protected. I'm safe. I have my little castle here, and it feels very comfortable. And it took me, I'm not kidding, years, actually, before I could do this. I'm still touching it. It's here. If I need it, I'm not far away. But now you can see the rest of my body. And then it took me another few years to do something which took a lot of courage. And that's this. This is scary. And yet, I want you to appreciate the difference between what you're seeing now and the atmosphere and the environment and what I'm doing now. And I'm not trying to imply that you should never speak behind a podium. Sometimes that's just the way it is, and sometimes it's, you feel more comfortable, and that's okay. I would just make the case that it's a challenge when people cannot see two-thirds of your body. And so that just means if you're going to do this, okay, but then you have to be that much more expressive with your face and with your voice and with your hands. And there are some speakers where for 50 minutes, the only thing moving is their lips. And that is a huge challenge to ask people to pay attention for 50 minutes if the only thing moving are your lips and your tongue. But that's it. And so physical movement is part of what can increase the expressiveness and then there's a concept that I want to introduce to you that comes from the social psychology world. Public space, social space, personal space, intimate space. Okay? Social, uh, sorry, public space is the space we have between us right now, or maybe on a street. Social space would be the space between people if they're having a group discussion at a cocktail party. That's social space. Personal space is a one-on-one -on -one conversation. And then intimate space is space between two people that you would only get to if you were intimate with some, with some person. The reason this is relevant to what we're talking about is if you as a speaker can move the, the group from public space to social space, you will increase their engagement. It is hard to not pay attention and be engaged when you're in the middle of social space. So you will sometimes see speakers actually come out into the audience like this. And that's why they're doing it. That's the function. None of you guys can look at your phones right now, right? Wouldn't that feel very awkward to you and uncomfortable? Because you're in social space, all right? And so I am not necessarily recommending that at your next research conference, you come down off the podium, walk into the aisle and say, so we didn't choose to do the Cox proportional hazards model because we thought we would do that with the next study. People would think you were weird, right? But I am saying this, if you are not constantly thinking about what you can do as a speaker to counteract the natural human decrement in attention, and it is natural and human, if you're not doing everything you can to counteract the natural human decrement in attention, then you're not being as effective a speaker as you can be. That's the idea. All right, let's talk about non-words. What are non-words? <clears throat> non-words are... Uh, um, so basically, these are space fillers, okay, space fillers. This is something else that's happening totally unconsciously. So a lot of the stuff I learned by going to a training program in public speaking that was actually held for business people. And the people who ran the course would, you did a lot of public speaking in front of the group, of course, as part of the training. They would snap every time you said, uh. Every time you said, ah, uh, they would snap their fingers. And they were ruthless. They didn't just do it during the sessions. We would be sitting at lunch on break, and I'd be saying, so I'm from Madison. I uh, have, uh, um, uh, uh. very disconcerting. It immediately ex extinguishes the behavior, though. And so you become aware of it right away. When you think about it, you realize how much you do it, and you can stop doing it if you're aware of it. But it's hard. It's very hard to do. It's actually very difficult. What is the etiology of non-words? What is the cause of this? It's because we're thinking about what we're going to say next, and we don't want any space. The space feels uncomfortable. So one of the solutions is practicing out loud. So when you are running through your talk, 
It's not enough to just say, okay, I'm going to talk about this, and then, yeah, I'll talk about that. Okay, then I'm going to talk about this. I'm saying you want to say out loud the words that you're going to say in order, in the order you're going to say them. And if you actually practice the syntax of what you're going to say over and over again, you have less of your brain occupied with thinking about what am I going to say next, and then you have to do less space filling. But the other part of it is even if sometimes you do have to pause, be comfortable with the pause. That's very hard to do. And yet pauses can be very powerful. When you pause, everybody pays attention. And so I want to show you one more video of an extremely effective use of this technique of pausing. And I want you to just get a feeling of how it feels to you as a listener as you listen to, this, to the pauses here. Just a disclaimer, this is a speech about surveillance of Muslims. I don't mean to make any political statement either way. I just want you to listen to the technique of how Obama uses pausing as he speaks and its effect on you. are very long pauses, and you can feel how it felt to you. You can't not listen. And so you're, the topics you talk about may not be as important as that one, but, the, but the, the teaching point here is that you can use this technique anytime. When you arrive at your key point in your talk, and you stop and pause, people will pay attention. Vocal variety and energy. So vocal variety is simply changing and modulating the inflection of your voice. So if I was to take the last 20 minutes of what we did together and say all of the words exactly the same, but just use a monotone, but everything otherwise was completely identical, you would all be asleep by now. And so you have to think about what you're doing with your voice and how you can use pitch and volume and inflection to make it more interesting. There's a technique you might want to avoid. Sometimes when people speak in public, they sometimes their voice goes up at the end of a sentence, and it sounds like you don't maybe completely know what you're talking about, and you come across as not being very authoritative. <laughs> Anybody have a teenager? And that leads us to energy. So energy is the sum of everything we've been talking about. And the more energy you can bring in when you are speaking in front of people, the more your voice changes, the more the gestures come out, the more your facial expression, and the more you move. So energy is the sum total of all of this. One of the ways you can ramp up your energy is use the nervousness. Leverage that nervousness that you have to make yourself more energetic. Telling a story can be very effective here. Telling a story almost always brings out the genuine person in you and becomes much more interesting when you tell. When you read literature from the business world on public speaking, over and over again you see this recommendation. Tell stories. Tell stories. Or ask your, show your enthusiasm for the topic. Whatever you're talking about is something you've chosen, generally. Why did you pick this topic? Why do you find it interesting? Why is it relevant to the people in the audience? Because what you say isn't automatically always relevant to them. Make it relevant. Tell them why. And that can increase the energy. I have found that it's almost always the case that a person cannot be too energetic. Almost. <laughs> My name is Bill Davidson, and I am seeking our party's nomination for the position of Scott County Treasurer on November 10th. November of 2010. Excuse me. In terms of elections across Stark County, I have represented our party twice on the county ballot in both the primary and the general elections.
Don't do this. <laughs> but it is true that if, you, if, you, if you're doing this and you feel like you're overdoing it, you're probably just hitting the sweet spot. Most of us would do well to increase our energy as we speak in front of a group of people. And so the final point to make about dynamic public speaking is thinking about the physical environment. Where are the seats? If you're in a small group setting, is, are there lines of sight between you and everybody you're talking to? How are the seats arranged? What's happening with the lighting? It's been my experience that, generally speaking, people like to turn the lights down lower than they need to be. And you as a speaker are constantly fighting the zone out factor anyway. You're constantly battling the urge to just pull out the phone. And when the lights go down, that becomes easier. And most of my slides you've been able to see, even though the lights are turned up up front here. And so my advice is usually turning up the lights will, will improve the atmosphere and make it more engaging. And usually you don't pay too much of a price with your slides like we often think we, we will. So we've talked about dynamic public speaking. Let's talk about techniques that can help you help your audience better understand what you're saying and retain what you're saying. Understanding and retention. And so we'll start by talking about emphasis. These are techniques that help you emphasize your key points. And this is all about retention. This is all about helping your learners in four weeks remember your key point. And the first one is cueing the important point. This is a very simple behavior. If you remember nothing else from our hour today, it's this. Or this is the most important thing I'm going to say all day. Or, okay, now pay attention to this. Anything like that. Anything like that is cueing your important point. And when you do that, everybody listens very briefly, but they listen. When you change the quality and speed of your voice, that can get people to key in on what you're saying. So if you were about to arrive at a very important point that you want to make to your group, when you slow down your voice, people listen. And my own goal is that the people I'm talking to are sick of the point that I'm making. If I have not bludgeoned them over the head at least 10 times with my take-home point, then I've not been as effective as I could be. So this is the purpose of a take-home point. It's not to bring up something new. The, the only purpose of a take-home point is, to, is that repetition is the key to retention. Repetition is the key to retention. And then there's this concept called active learning. The best way, I think, to explain this is to compare it to the opposite, passive learning. Passive learning is what you're doing right now. You're silent. You're just, you're just listening. And I am banking on somehow holding your attention for 50 minutes while you sit there and do nothing but just look. That's a challenge. Active learning is where you have your learners engage with the material. They interact with it. They work with it. They reformulate it. And there are several ways to do this, and I'm going to show you just one because of the limitation of time, and that's an audience response system. And that, this is a terrific technique to create active learning. So raise your hands now if you have used one of the clickers. You know they pass out the clickers that you hit A, B, C, D to answer the question? Okay, keep up your hands. If any of you have invested in the clicker companies, you made a terrible financial decision. <laughs> the days of the clickers are over. In the last, like, two years, this is brand new, there is now software that allows you, as a teacher, to have people use their cell phones to answer these questions that you want to give, which is brilliant. Have any of you guys seen the technique where, you know, a show of hands, who picks A? And, like, three people raise their hands, and no one picks B or C, and 97% of people don't even raise their hands at all because they don't want people to see what they picked. This is totally anonymous. So everyone want to take out their cell phones right now. Take out your cell phones and open up your browser app. So if you have an iPhone, you want to open up Safari. If you have an Android, you want to go to Google Chrome. Whatever app you use that allows you to get on the Internet, and I want you to type in this address. If you have a laptop, by the way, open right now, you can do the same thing if you go to your browser. If you don't have a cell phone, I have no solution for you. But anyway, go to pollev.com slash jpsmith and... The, the, I just shifted to the slide here, but look at the top. The, the address is still there if you're wondering what it is. And what is your favorite Ito? Doritos, Tostitos, Fritos, or Cheetos? 
If you look up now, you can see in real time, my PowerPoint is collecting the data and showing everybody in the audience. Nobody likes Tostitos? Showing the audience the answer. It's magic. Why is this such a useful technique? Multiple reasons. Multiple reasons. First of all, learning climate. The learning environment. Everybody is taking out a phone. Everybody is looking at their answer. They're thinking. They're engaged. They're interested again. They're not tuning out. So it, it immediately re-engages the audience. That's number one, but that's not all. You can use a technique like this at the beginning of a talk to assess the baseline level of knowledge of your group. And if they know point A already cold, you can skip that. And point B, they don't understand at all, you can spend more time on that. So you immediately will become much more efficient with the time that you're about to use with your learners. Or you can use this after you've delivered the content and see how they learned it. How effective was your teaching? So for multiple reasons, this sort of software, I think, is going to just change everything. And we can talk later when we have more time about the logistics and cost issues and things like that. But I just wanted to demonstrate that for you. Oh my gosh, it was a tie. Cheetos and Doritos. Okay. And so finally, let's talk about leveraging visual aids. What do we do with this thing? And if there's one point that I want you to remember from everything we say about this, it is this. You are the speaker. You are the speaker. You are not there to interpret the slides. The slides are there to interpret you. This is not a slideshow that you are narrating. You want people to be looking at you and listening to you. And the function of the visual aid is just to summarize what you said or show an image that captures what your point is. But you can gauge your success at this by looking at the eyes of the audience and seeing where they are. Not everything has to be on a slide. There is a reason that you've never seen this slide before. Okay? And so that leads us to the 7x7 seven seven rule. This is seven bullets per slide, seven words per bullet. Seven bullets per slide, people can do that usually. Seven words per bullet is very difficult. No, I, I can't get it to seven. I've got to have all 12 of these words here, otherwise it doesn't make sense. Yes, you can get it to seven. Yes, you can get it to seven. If you are with your bullet going over to the next line, stop. Shrink it. This is just reiterating the point that you don't want people to be reading what's on the screen. You want them to be listening to what you're saying and glancing at this to reiterate your point. People can attend to one of two things. They can listen to what you're saying and process that and understand it. Or they can read what's on the screen and process and understand that. They cannot do both. Do not force them to make that choice. Some people will listen to you and ignore what you've worked on here. Or some people will read and ignore what you say. We're trying to avoid this. This is my own talk. But this is the problem with this violating the 7x7 seven seven rule. This is very difficult. If you ever find yourself uttering the words, I'm really sorry, this is a really busy slide, I apologize. <laughs> Anyone ever heard that? Next time that happens, go to your office and change the slide. B is for blank. This is just a little 30-second trick. When you are just about to arrive at a really key point in your talk and you want everyone to just pay attention for three seconds, just walk over and hit B. And PowerPoint, at least, it goes blank. When the slide, when the screen goes black, it's, it's an incredible phenomenon. All of the eyes immediately shift and look at your face. And you have them for, like, three seconds. Then they're gone again. B is for blank. Using images. So it is generally true, generally true, that your visual aids will be more engaging if you have an image than text. And so anytime you're able to take a concept and use an image to make the point rather than text, it's going to be more dynamic and more engaging. So when I talked back when I was talking about public speaking, and we talked about the physical environment, I showed you this. And I made some points about what to do and what to think about with regard to the physical environment, and you were looking at that picture. I could have done this. So it's very important that you pay attention to the physical environment. This does include lights and what the lights are doing. And if the lights are too far down, people will go to sleep. You should also pay attention to the seats. Okay? Versus making those same points with this. 
So, another example. So, there are three categories of inciting agents for hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Birds and bird droppings, farm-related, and water-related, including hot tubs and ventilation. Or, I could say this. There are three categories of inciting agents for hypersensitivity pneumonitis. <laughs> You're going to have a nightmare about this, right? <laughs> this is going to stick in your brain. Okay? Advertisers know this. Advertisers know this. This is an entire page ad that Verizon took out with like seven words on it. And of course, the masters of advertising know this too, Apple. And so looking at an image is always going to be more engaging for an audience member than you cranking out a bunch of text. There's one thing that you would like to generally avoid, and that is the overuse of this technique, animation. Somebody, PowerPoint, I think, actually had to pay somebody to devise all of the different ways that animation can be used to make a presentation as interesting as possible, even at the cost of inducing vertigo and cerebellar ischemia. This is a technique to avoid. And finally, I want to introduce to you an equation, a mathematical equation that you should remember if you're doing any kind of public presentation, and that is this. Okay? All right? Can you do that? This is called PowerPoint myopia. Avoid it. So we've talked already about specific behaviors that will capture the attention of the audience, help you promote their understanding and their retention of what you're saying. We just finished talking about visual aid. So now we're going to talk a little bit about this coaching program. And so let's start by kind of understanding the concept here. Everybody needs a coach. Even the greatest of all time have a coach. We have recognized that this is a helpful concept in the world of athletics. Recently, people have felt like this might be useful in the world of medicine, coaching. And it relies on two concepts. The first one being direct observation. You have heard people, including me, talk to you about the importance of actually watching somebody perform in order to gauge whether or not they're any good at it and to help them get better. So direct observation is an accepted concept in the realm of clinical skills. It would stand to reason that it would also be helpful if we were trying to coach people to be better teachers, right? And the second concept is something called deliberate practice. And this is the idea that in order to achieve mastery of a skill, you need to continually practice that skill with ongoing receipt of feedback. And these two concepts together serve as the foundation for the idea of coaching in the world of medicine. There's actually good data in the world of surgery with coaching. And there are actually people at this institution doing good work with that. Less data in the world of medicine. And as far as I can tell, there really is no data with coaching people to be better presenters in the world of medicine. And so, we in the Department of Medicine, uh, Laura Zakowski and I were able to get sponsored with an educational grant from our Department of Medicine to do some of this work. And so we thought that a good target audience would be people giving grand rounds. Why? This is pretty challenging. Number one, it is a large group of people that you're trying to, to teach. Number two, it is didactic, usually. That's a challenge. And number three, you're usually talking about something pretty unique, something uh, narrow, something that's your own research. So People who give grand rounds are just set up for a big challenge when it comes to presentations. So we offered last academic year all assistant professors the opportunity to be coached, all assistant professors who were going to be giving grand rounds. And so they had observation by a trained coach. That turned out to be yours truly. And what we did was 30 minutes of just observation of the dry run and then 45 minutes of feedback and practice of new behaviors. We use an iPad to capture the presentation and use that to look at what behaviors were done. That was helpful. And then everyone got a written summary after the verbal feedback, a written summary of their feedback as well. So we covered public speaking techniques, as we just did this morning, but in probably more detail. We talked about techniques to promote understanding and retention, including communication of teaching goals and organization and clarity in how you present. And, point, and how to emphasize key points, and we talked about effective use of PowerPoint. And this is an example of one of the written 
feedback summaries that was given. And if we zoom in here, uh, just as an example, eye contact. You are frequently looking at the slide with your back to the audience. Sometimes this is necessary, but you might be able to use graphics in your slides instead of the laser pointer so that you're looking at your audience more consistently. And pauses and non-words. Your occasional uhs will lessen as you continue running through your talk. And you might actually consider injecting some pauses here and there to emphasize a key point and allow your audience to process a more complicated explanation. So what do we find with this coaching program? First of all, we were excited by this figure. Out of 10 people who were asked, nine said yes. We thought that was huge. It's daunting. It's daunting to have somebody tell you, I'm going to watch you, and then I'm going to give you feedback on how you do. So, but it turned out that these folks were just excited to get the opportunity to get better. So we thought that was terrific. And so we asked them a few questions at the end. As a result of this coaching program, do you now feel more comfortable delivering a large group presentation? On a 1 through 10 scale, 10 being much more comfortable, we got a 9.4. As a result of this coaching program, to what extent do you feel your presentation skills have improved? 9.6. So clearly their sense of self-effectiveness, self-efficacy, and self-confidence was increased as a result of the coaching. So we were in the nines there, and then we asked, now are you more likely to volunteer for speaking opportunities? And the results kind of plummeted, which we thought was a good thing. It serves to validate the tool, right? They were actually being honest with us. Would you recommend this coaching program to others? And it was a solid 10. When we asked them qualitatively, what were the things that were most impactful to you? The use of the POW statement came up again and again as something that resonated with our speakers as something that they liked and wanted to continue trying to do. The idea of physical movement was something that they referred to over and over. They, uh, the theme came back about more concise slides, more engaging slides, and they also commented frequently on changing what they did with speech and with voice. And so I want to show you, to kind of wrap up here, two videos pre and post. Both of these folks have agreed to let me show these videos. This is Dudley Lamming, terrific member of our department who gave a terrific grand rounds last year on protein metabolism in mice. So what I'm going to show you here is the pre, and then I'll show you the post. This is, this is the dry run before we talked about anything. And I just want you to pay attention to, this is the first thing he says. This is the very beginning. I want to apologize for the audio. It's very quiet, and we just couldn't get it any louder. So everyone, just be as quiet as you can, and just try to listen carefully to this. Here's Dudley, same point in his talk, the very first thing he says after. And this is Nate Sandbo. And what I want you to pay attention to with this pre and post is something else. I want you to look at the, he has now finished his objectives and he's about to kind of launch into his talk. I want you to pay attention to the first slide that he has chosen to use to launch into his talk, pre and post. So look at the slide. It's the one just after this one. You'll see him change it in a second. And secondly, I want you to key in on what Nate does with his body, with physical movement. Here's the pre. And this is Nate after. Same moment in the talk. So, wouldn't you be surprised if I told you that idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis kills as many people in the United States per year as automobile accidents? I think for non-pulmonologists out there, that might be a bit of a shocking statement. But it's true. Idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis shown here uh, with a few deaths uh, per year of several common cancers. Somewhere in the 
So you can see what, uh, and the, again, apologize for the audio on that, but you can see that we felt like we had made some improvements in people's presentation skills. And so we have some next steps. One of them is more robust evaluation data. That evaluation tool has the potential for a lot of bias, so we're working on better ways to compare the pre and post. We're also working on trying to create a cadre of people to enable peer coaching, so it's not just one person. In fact, we're just about to launch in the Division of General Internal Medicine a coaching program where some of... Uh, of our teachers are going to be teaching and learning from each other. That's just about to launch in GIM. And finally, of course, we would like to expand this beyond Grand Rounds to other various venues. So how do we avoid becoming Ferris Bueller's teacher? I want to take just the last 30 seconds here. I'd like everyone to, I told you to take out a piece of paper. I want everyone to jot down one thing that you want to do differently the next time you have to present based on everything you heard today. Just write down one thing and put it on your phone if you want, whatever you can write on, one thing that you'd like to do differently. And let's take 30 seconds for that. Okay. And so if I'm being the best teacher I can be, I'm going to reiterate my goals to you one more time. Do you feel bludgeoned? I'm hoping you're walking out of here being able to use some new specific behaviors to help you capture the attention of an audience and help them understand you. Number two, I'm hoping you're able to use visual aids now more effectively. And number three, I hope you can understand and be able to maybe describe this coaching program we talked about. Oh my gosh, how did that sneak in there? <laughs> Holy cow. I want to thank you all for your attention, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks, Jeremy. That was wonderful. Uh, I'll ask you to call on the audience and please repeat the question. Sure. Molly. That was great. Um, I noticed all your examples, except for this one, were white men. And there's a lot of literature that men and women are socialized to communicate differently. I'm wondering if any of the recommendations have a gendered aspect. You have exposed my bias, and I appreciate that. You're absolutely right. Um, I have... Uh, no, I really have no defense. I think that I appreciate you bringing up the point for the group that as we think about incorporating examples and images and things that we kind of bring from the Internet into our talks, that we have to be thinking about uh, inclusion and, and inequality and things like that. So I think it's a point well made. Other questions? Anne. So the question is, what do you do about when you're being asked, when they're just recording you and no one's there and it's going to be shown later to a group of people? And that, of course, presents a challenge for you because it's just difficult to maintain the energy when you just have a camera in front of you. And you're right, there's no one to make eye contact with. But I would argue that almost all the other behaviors that I put in those slides are still relevant. And in fact, I think you need to recognize that when someone's just going to be watching a video, you need to amp up even more your energy and your use of gestures, and your voice inflection, and everything you do to try to make it as engaging as possible. So the eye contact, no, but everything else I think still applies and in fact has to be emphasized even more. Hey Jeremy, can I build on that? I really like the comment you made about, or the emphasis you're putting on looking around the audience. Um, and the fact that we kind of key in on the person who, who's keyed in on us. Um, at the same time as a speaker, there's nothing more disheartening than to, to have the person who's not at all keyed in. And, and you might say, well, that's the person you really want to focus on. But, but at the same time, as a speaker, you, I find myself losing energy and kind of needing to concentrate on someone who's, who's looking my way. How do you adjust for that natural tendency in all of us? Right. So I think it's a different, there's a difference between the small group setting and the large group setting. And I would, a lot of us do small group teaching and chalk talks and we're in conference rooms. And there, I think it's okay and probably useful and, and, and correct to engage the one who's disengaged with a verbal statement, with a question, uh, with a little pop quiz or something that forces them to get engaged. Now, in the large group setting, like you're talking about, you're probably not going to be able to do that. And so I think, you know, all you can do in that format is to use what, you, what energy you can get from the audience to maintain your own energy. And I think in that setting, it's fine to not look at someone who's been on their phone the whole time. I think it's much more important to do that when you're in a small group setting and someone's on their phone. Bennett.
Yeah, so the question is motivation, and why am I okay like standing up on a stage in front of people, which for a lot of people is, uh, is, is terrifying. And I think, I don't know, I think some of it is probably, some of it's got to be kind of natural. Like I did plays and stuff when I was in high school, and I was used to being on stage, and, um, and, and I think that's part of it. But I think another, I would jump off that point by saying this. I have always loved teaching. And when I was a resident, I loved teaching. I would love to get in front of the blackboard. But what I recognize now is I didn't know really what I was doing. There's a whole set of skills and techniques, whether it comes to public speaking or whether it comes to teaching or whether it comes to research. Um, and, and a lot of us are kind of doing this off the cuff, and we've never been trained in how to do any of this stuff except how to take care of patients. And so what I've done is just avail myself of the opportunities to build the skills behind it. And so I think all of us, you know, would do well to seek out those opportunities to look for programs that can actually train us in the, in, in the skills and techniques that lie behind our own innate interests. Thank you for the comments. Okay. Thanks, everybody. I want to thank Jeremy just for an outstanding grand rounds. It gets better each year. Thanks, Rick. That was nice.